Good afternoon, and welcome to day two of the 2020 AHOA Convention and Trade Show. It is heartening to see so many hoteliers, vendors, and industry partners participating in this new and exciting virtual event. Although we are all apart, this format allows AHOA to continue to bring people together. Today, we are going to hear from some of our industry's top association executives, data analysts, and young professional hoteliers. The COVID-19 pandemic continues to have a profound impact on all facets of the hospitality industry. With today's lineup, we will dig a little deeper into the industry's initial response and more importantly, where we go from here. Let's kick things off with our first panel, which will explore advocating for the hospitality industry and the road to recovery. Our panelists lead the three most influential associations in the hospitality industry. Please welcome Cecil Staten, President and CEO of AHOA. Roger Dow, President and CEO of the U.S. Travel Association. And Chip Rogers, President and CEO of AHLA. Hello, I'm Cecil Staten, President and CEO of AHOA. Welcome to AHOACon 20. Today, we are pleased to be joined by industry experts and longtime friends to AHOA members. We're going to discuss today how hoteliers will survive this pandemic, the ongoing efforts policymakers are involved in to expedite the recovery of the economy of our country, and what we can do to make our voices heard. First, let me welcome our panelists. I'm pleased to welcome Roger Dow, President and CEO of U.S. Travel. Roger serves as President of U.S. Travel, the association which represents all segments of travel in the United States. And U.S. Travel's mission is to increase travel to and within the United States. Previously, Roger served as the Vice President for Global Sales at Marriott International. As an advocate for our industry, Roger has been instrumental in establishing and renewing Brand USA, the highly effective national travel and tourism promotion program, the creation of the Meetings Mean Business Coalition, and the Visit USA Coalition. Under Roger's leadership, U.S. Travel is the recognized leader in industry research and analysis and has long been a champion of hoteliers and our members. Next, I'm glad to welcome Chip Rogers, President and CEO of AHLA. Chip joined the American Hotel and Lodging Association as President and CEO in January 2019. He previously served as President and CEO of AHOA as we all know. Prior to joining the hospitality industry, Chip had a long career as a public servant. We previously served together in the Georgia General Assembly where he served as Senate Majority Leader and I served as the Senate Majority Caucus Whip. He's been a great advocate for hoteliers and he knows AHOA members very, very well. Now we're gonna open our discussion up. I want to talk for a few minutes about COVID as an economic disruptor. At each stage in my career, I've seen disruptions, whether in education, communications, uh, in publishing, or even now in hospitality. COVID, it seems, is the ultimate disruptor for our economy and for our industry. It's changing how we travel. It's changing how we go about our daily lives and how hoteliers interact with guests and employees. We've seen some once in a lifetime changes without guests and revenues. Uh, we've seen our income plummet. We've been forced to lay off more than half of our employees and defaults and delinquency levels are growing to record levels. Hoteliers face unprecedented uncertainty and are forging new paths in order to survive. Largely, our members have remained resilient and they're leaning on their associations in order to advocate for them, to ensure that they have the tools they need to bridge this crisis. 
Roger, tell us how things are looking across the travel landscape in our country. Well, uh, Cecil, you hit the nail on the head. It's the most difficult time any of us ever seen, 10 times worse than September 11th. You talked about half the people unemployed and uh, the, the loss of, we'll lose over $500 billion as an industry this year. Uh, several things we're working on uh, to try and, uh, one, make sure we survive, as you said, is one uh, for the DMOs, the destination market organizations, we've got to get them back in the PPP program. They were never included, and we had a good call with Marco Rubio uh, last week about that. Uh, very important to OHO members is hotels under 300 rooms. We want it classified as small businesses, uh, you know, even though they might be part of a larger network. Uh, we're also uh, trying to expand the uh, recovery uh, loan program. Uh, most important is uh, liability protection. You don't need somebody going into an AHO member's hotel and going home and say they got COVID in your property and then trying to sue you. Uh, we want to increase testing. Uh, we want to expand the employee tax credit, uh, EDA grants to promote health and safety. So whatever you're doing as an industry to promote health and safety, a grant for that. And lastly, we're looking for $10 billion for airports. Uh, they're so critical to us. So they're, they're the kind of things we're working on. And as uh, we'll talk about later, Congress is a mess. They can't agree on anything. Thank you, Roger. Chip, can you help us focus in a little bit more on the lodging industry specifically? Well, Cecil, first, uh, thanks for having me. It's great great to see you and uh, great to, in at least in a virtual sense, see all my, my AHOA friends that I've grown to love over the last uh, 10 years of, uh, prior to coming to HLA. Uh, and I wish we were all in Orlando together, but we are not. So we will have to make the best of it, and that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, speaking of, of making the best of it, we are pushing forward with efforts to try to make sure that hoteliers um, can remain afloat. And, and that is really, I think, the key message that we're passing along to the lawmakers is, you know, there's a lot of folks out there talking about recovery, uh, promotion, stimulus, and those things. And those are clearly important, no question about it. But right now, so many in our, in our industry are just trying to keep the doors open uh, and, and make sure that there's a job for those employees to come back to. So one of the most successful things that has happened uh, has been the PPP. The problem is the PPP was originally created to last about eight to 10 weeks. Um, we now know that this problem is going to exist uh, for the rest of this year and well into next year and probably many years in our industry. So the notion that an eight to 10 week fix would fix the problem um, is, is a little short-sighted, but no one could have seen this way back in March when the original PPP was passed. So we're asking specifically for another round of PPP funding for those businesses that have lost 35% or more of their revenue. The current HEALS Act offers that uh, at a 50% or more revenue loss. We believe we, that that should go down to about 35%. Um, two other areas that need immediate addressing, and that is on the Main Street Lending Act, effectively all hoteliers have been written out of the law. Uh, because of the way that the debt tests are written in that legislation, no one in our industry has gained access to any Main Street lending funding. And we think that that, that is a great place where money exists right now today that Congress does not have to reappropriate that could be eligible for members to access immediately. And then the second part is, how do we fix the CMBS problem? We know that about a third of all CMBS, uh, or I should say a third of all hotel debt is CMBS. We also know that about a quarter of all CMBS loans are in delinquency already. This is gonna quickly be followed by foreclosure and it's going to devastate our industry. And so here's another area where Congress and or the administration can take action to fix this problem, and frankly, uh, without any new laws. Uh, we can fix the CMBS problem uh, by creating a vehicle that allows the government to have preferred equity uh, so that, that those folks with CMBS loans can gain access to something just to keep their businesses afloat. Again, I want to stress that what we're promoting for our industry is not some sort of uh, effort to help improve necessarily the bottom line compared to last year. What folks are worried about is how do I keep my hotel open? And so that's what our efforts are all centered on. You know, one of the things that's impressed me since joining AHOA back in November of last year, and by the way, when I joined, had no idea that we would be facing uh, this disruption uh, just a few months into my tenure. But one of the things that's impressed me about this industry is how uh, various associations representing different groups have come together and worked 
diligently uh, during the pandemic to, to be an advocate together, uh, strength in numbers with our government, both at the federal and state levels. So that's been very impressive to me. And I know uh, whether it's been our team in Washington, D.C., or what uh, you're doing, Roger, at U.S. Travel, or Chip, you with your team at AHLA, it's, it's been great to see that cooperation and coming together in order to be an advocate. But I wonder if we could just spend a moment uh, more talking about what has been accomplished, because I think a lot of great things have been accomplished. You were pointing out some of the deficiencies a moment ago, Chip. But can you talk just a little bit about what we have been able to accomplish working together across our industries uh, in hospitality and travel uh, through the CARES Act and, and the things that really have, at least to this point, made some difference? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, uh, Cecil. Look, the, first you had the legislation, and I'll get to that in just a second, but I, I would commend Roger and his team at U.S. Travel. You know, the thing that is the ultimate solution to this is for people to start traveling again and staying in hotels. <laughs> Outside of that, everything else is really a stopgap measure. And so what U.S. Travel has done, and we've partnered with them, and I know AHOA has as well, is to make sure that we're all doing our part to send that message to, to the traveling public that it's safe, and re with respect to hotels, it's certainly clean, and you can get out there and travel again, and you can enjoy life, and a hotel can be part of that experience. And so I think we've done a really good job in doing that. The safe stay guidelines that we implemented for the hotel industry that AHOA partnered with us on have made a big difference. Uh, we've had billions and billions of media impressions of folks looking at that and coming away, hopefully, with the notion that, you know, if I go to a hotel, it is pretty safe and clean. You see the medical experts coming out and saying that hotels are some of the safest places you can be. So even outside of the government action, the efforts to make sure we're sending that message that people can travel safely is critically important. And with what you, Roger and U.S. Travel do of making sure that's from the moment you leave your home until you return home, that's, that's really important. Now, with respect to legislation, look, it all started back originally with the PPP. Now, keep in mind, when the PPP was created, the first thing that they did was said, look, we're not going to create a different delivery mechanism. We're not going to create something new. We're going to go through the SBA. Now, that's really important because the SBA limits uh, their loans to companies that have 500 employees or fewer, which meant a lot of hotels would have been written out of the legislation because remember it, it pertains to your ownership group so just because you own a hotel if you own other businesses and collectively all those businesses equal up to 500 employees then your hotel and all your other businesses would not have been eligible no matter how small they are and so in addition to getting the ppp we were also able to get them to waive the affiliation rule and make sure that hotels and restaurants would be treated as individual business units and what that meant effectively was this. When we started with the PPP, if we had not waived the affiliation rule and treated each hotel individually, about 62% of hotels across the U.S. would have been eligible to get PPP uh, funding. Because we were able to do that, that took that to about 98% of hotels. And so you had thousands of hotels that then gained access to those PPP funds that were so important. And the last thing I'll say is it's not just happening at the federal level, but it's also happening at the state level. I know there's all sorts of other federal uh, victories that we had. And we don't have time to go through all of them today. But at the state level, one of the things we've been pushing for is making sure that hotels aren't the victims and the targets of what I would call frivolous lawsuits. We've seen this in the past, even before the coronavirus. And we knew that it was coming with the coronavirus, that people would claim or certain attorneys would claim that they're client or their, their, the person they're representing was a victim and that they, they got the coronavirus at a hotel, uh, despite the fact it would be almost impossible to, uh, to be able to prove that. And so we began working at the local level to see what could happen there. I'm proud to say that the home state of Ahoa, Georgia, was the latest uh, state uh, to actually put this into law when the governor, Governor Kemp, signed this last week and became the 10th state in the U.S. to provide liability protection so that hoteliers and other small businesses are not sued because of the coronavirus. Uh, we believe Nevada will soon become the 11th state to do that here in the next few days. So despite the inaction at the federal level on this issue, we have been working at the local level, state by state, to make sure this happens. And so far, we've got 10 going on 11 states. So, you know, it's happening in our industry. It's happening at the federal level and it's happening at the state level. There are a lot of victories to point to during these very difficult times. Roger, uh 
Talk to us a little bit about perhaps some of the deficiencies that uh, were there in spite of the CARES Act and the successes, uh, some areas of our industry that maybe didn't get the support or what it really needed at this point in time. Sure. Uh, first of all, as, uh, SHIP was kind enough to shout out what we've been doing, but we've been linked at the hip. I remember meeting SHIP, uh, gosh, five, eight years ago with AHOA and then having come to Washington. And we've been uh, spending so much time working together. And I think that's important that we have AHOA, HNLA, U.S. Travel all on the same page. But one of the areas that uh, got left out, I mentioned earlier, was the the DMOs, the Convention of Visitors Bureaus in each of your towns, uh, they're 501c6s uh, by charter, and they were cut out of PPP, which means all the Convention and Visitors Bureaus have no money to bring their people back. And that's a phenomenal shortcoming because when time is right to bring people back, they're not going to have the resources of the people. So that that's one of the big things. And as Chip mentioned earlier, which uh, got fixed, is to link uh, a, multiple units as one unit uh, and disqualifying them from uh, several of the areas. So we're able to get uh, that passed. And uh, so we think that's a big problem. The biggest efficiency is we can't get Congress to act as adults and look at what's right for our businesses and for the people, and, and that's bickering that's going on, causing the president came in with his executive order, and now that's back and forth, and hopefully we'll get them to the table and agree on the next phase, because this isn't just you know fun politics. This is serious. This is people's lives. It's their employee lives, and we've got to get the Congress back to doing the work for the American people. Thank you, Roger. Someone said to me yesterday, we really don't need a Democrat bill. We don't need a Republican bill. We need a bill that's good for small business in the U.S. economy. You know, just this weekend, we saw President Trump sign executive orders to help prevent the economic crisis from worsening. Part of that was a payroll tax cut for workers earning under $100,000. There was an extension of unemployment earnings or benefits to $400 per week, extending the moratorium on residential evictions and extending uh, student loan deferrals. All of these things, of course, are important. It remains to be seen uh, how effective uh, they may be moving forward. But I guess the real issue, as you've just uh, suggested, is uh, you know getting Congress to ultimately do what Congress should do. I do want to remain optimistic, and I hope you are, that working together, we'll still see Congress uh, come together for a larger negotiated deal over the next several days or perhaps weeks. And I know a big issue for hoteliers, as has already been mentioned, is looking at banking directives that will bring relief for CMBS borrowers, perhaps a second round of PPP funding changes to the EIDL program, and then liability protection at the federal level would be great. These are all important, and I'm just proud uh, to say that at AHOA, we are partners with you, and we thank you for that partnership, together with other organizations in our industry uh, working together on all of these important fronts. Now I wanna shift gears, uh, state and local issues. Uh, a lot of what we do is obviously at the federal level, but I wonder what you're hearing from your members about unique issues at the state and local level. And Chip, I want to ask you about one in particular that I know uh, you've commented on, and that has to do with uh, the burden uh, hoteliers can potentially uh, encounter uh, because of um, organized labor's activities, such as we've seen in San Francisco and even in Phoenix. Yeah, really dangerous stuff happening. It's really sad to see at a time when so many people are hurting uh, that there are organizations that would exploit these times uh, for their own gain. Unfortunately, uh, they haven't really thought through this. And so when they think they're doing something that's going to actually help them or their members, what they're actually doing is hurting them, their members, and sadly, all the rest of the industry at the same time. So what we saw in San Francisco is perhaps the worst case example. Now, we began working way back at the end of March, and that does seem like a long time ago, to put together a set of actual guidelines to help make hotels clean and safe. Actual guidelines. And the reason I say they're actual is because we brought together all the important people into proverbial room uh, in an electronic sense these days 
to talk about what are the things that can be done to make sure that, that rooms are clean and safe. We also work with our partner. I know is a great partner with, uh, with, with AHOA as well, Ecolab, who, who probably sells more cleaning products around the world than anybody else. And so, you know, we brought these experts together to say, what can we do as an industry to make sure that hotel rooms are clean and safe? We did that in March. We then took that to the CDC, the recognized expert on this, had them review our guidelines and make comments on those. And we changed uh, some of the things we were working on because of what the CDC said. So we now began, we took that in March and implemented it over the next few months. So now fast forward to July, when all of a sudden um, you have organized labor come to the Board of Supervisors in San Francisco and say, hey, we got an idea on how hotels can be clean. Now, keep in mind, this is a city that has a very difficult time even cleaning its own streets. So the notion that they would know how to clean hotel rooms is just foreign to anybody. It's, it's almost silly on its face. But nonetheless, uh, organized labor got them to pass an, an emergency cleaning ordinance. And this emergency cleaning ordinance is one of the worst things you could ever imagine because it does a, it, it fails in many respects. Number one, it doesn't make guests any safer. In fact, it, it makes it more dangerous for guests. It makes it more dangerous for the working uh, the, for the employees of the hotel, and it costs enormous amounts of money that are going to do nothing but keep hotels closed or close those that are already open. Um, so this has just been a terrible idea that started in San Francisco. We're now seeing it pop up in other places. It's having an enormously negative impact on our industry. Uh, as I mentioned in San Francisco, some of the hotels that had reopened are now having to close their doors because simply this, uh, this one policy that was passed by the Board of Supervisors, by the way, with no input whatsoever uh, from the health board there in San Francisco. And so we're fighting this all over the place. It's really important stuff, uh, it, but it's very really sad to see at the same time that there are people out there that would take this terrible situation and make it even worse. Thanks, Chip. Roger, uh, it was mentioned a moment ago, the great work that you and U.S. Travel have done just on the general issue of this economy. We've got to get it open again. We've got to get people traveling again, uh, feeling safe. And uh, obviously, uh, one of the things that's been challenging to that are all the restrictions around the country, certain states now not allowing people from other states to travel without uh, quarantining for 14 days, those kinds of things. I wonder what you're seeing and feeling about that, the reopening and the regional implications of this. I know you've done research on travel metrics and tra traveler sentiment. Can you share with uh, our viewers today uh, what you're, you're thinking at this point in time? Uh, certainly. Uh, one of the biggest problems you mentioned, Cecil, is uh, states, uh, New York, <clears throat> New Jersey, Connecticut, the District of Columbia, putting travel restrictions on people from other states. Uh, I think uh, they're up to over 30 states. Uh, pretty soon it'll be no one will be able to travel from other states to these places. And we're totally against that. We've uh, we pushed very strongly. It, it's so harmful. Uh, we had our first meeting ever in DC face-to-face uh, -face, uh, since COVID. And we had about 50 people. And the morning of that meeting, uh, the mayor put in a restriction of anyone from outside from 20 some states couldn't come to DC. Fortunately, they were all there, but you think how that stops things. I live in uh, St. Petersburg, Florida and work in DC. So that means if I'm gonna go to DC to get together with Chip, I gotta go 14 days early so we can get together or meet him in Maryland where he lives, so that'd be easier. Uh, but that's a big problem. Uh, we're also seeing that the states are opening in a sporadic basis. Uh, West Coast states are the rural states, I would say, states like Wyoming is only down 7%, uh, uh, Montana 17%, South Dakota 21%. But you see the uh, more urban areas, New York is down 83%, DC, uh, Nevada, uh, Massachusetts down 78%. So we've got to uh, try and get some consistency of how these states are opening. Uh, you know, Georgia's pretty open, where I am in Florida is open, but there's such confusion among travelers. And as that confusion exists, it's going to hurt the whole country, not just one area. So we've got to get this whole country talking from the same set of uh, words and guidelines and the travel and health and safety things that Chip talked about, we all worked on together. And they were so important to get people to understand that hotels are probably cleaner than your house these days. You know, another in, uh, interesting issue that I know uh, we've been working on uh, at the state level has to do with the property tax challenges our members 
are facing. It's a significant cost burden that hoteliers at this moment in time simply cannot afford. Uh, it has proven difficult, the evidence we've received from our members to, to arrange workouts and local governments have not uh, always been willing to do that. There have been lots of delays uh, in trying to get things worked out. So I know we're advocating for some federal funding potentially to offset costs associated with this to states and local governments. But uh, this is another big issue that's out there that we're gonna continue to work on. I, I wanna think again, uh, think for a few moments with you uh, forward. Uh, I've got a couple of more questions and we're down to about uh, five or six minutes. But Chip, you mentioned earlier the importance of health and safety protocols. Uh, that's going to be so critical to getting our industry moving forward and getting people traveling again. Any other thoughts on, on how you see that panning out in the coming days? Well, look, as every day goes by, we learn something more about coronavirus and how it's transmitted. And, and, and so if you go back just a few months ago, if you recall, there was a time when our, our medical experts were saying, don't wear face coverings, leave those only to the health professionals. You know, what you really need to do is clean every surface and clean it constantly. Uh, we now know that getting the coronavirus from a surface is, is, is very difficult, right? I'm not saying it doesn't happen. And I'm not saying, I'm not suggesting that you don't clean. What I'm suggesting is, is what, what we've learned is that it's person to person contact. So the fear that anyone would have being inside their hotel, hotel room is probably unwarranted fear. Um, and if you're actually going to the grocery store, I can't imagine that there's any level of, 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 of danger greater than going in a grocery store as compared to being in a hotel lobby, right? As long as you have on your face covering and you're maintaining that social distance. And so I think it's important for us to continue to keep up with the science. Um, and that's where a lot of these local ordinances are so, first of all, they're not scientifically based, they're politically based. And once they're in place, they, they're very difficult to change. And yet the knowledge we have about this virus continues to change, which really highlights the fact that as an industry, we need to be the ones that are continually keeping up with it. And I think we've done a really good job so far. But as Roger has pointed out many times before, and he and I talk about this a lot, the only way to solve this problem in the long term is for people to get out there and travel again. And the only way they're going to travel again is if they feel safe. And so it's our job to continue across the board for all these industries involved in travel to continue to send that message that hotels are safe, traveling is safe, you are missing out on a great portion of the wonderful things in life if you're not taking advantage of being able to travel. And we got to continue to promote that. That doesn't just stop because there's a pandemic. Uh, and, and there will come a day in the very near term um, where we're going to have to promote that at an even higher level and incentivize that. That's critically important. Uh, but that's the only answer is to get people traveling again and get them back at the hotels. Roger, I know you've been an advocate for the impact, the financial impact of what is happening to our industry as it impacts the United States economy. It is enormous. I wonder what your thoughts are moving forward, the data you're seeing uh, about really what is likely to happen uh, as we get into uh, the, uh, more into the third and fourth quarters of this year and throughout uh, 2021. Yeah. Uh we basically uh, do a lot of research on sentiment. 49% uh, of the people say they are going to take a trip involving a hotel uh, in the next couple of months. That's very good. It goes up to 60% when they say, if they know that right health and safety guidelines are there. That's why what Chip was saying is so important that people understand what's going on. I was talking to Ed Bastian, who's the CEO of Delta recently, and he was saying, you know, people think that the planes have the same air going around, he said, Roger, he said, and he told me all the things you're doing. He said, if it was so bad to travel, why aren't my flight attendants sick? He said, they're on flights all day long. And he said, their incidence is so low compared to the public. So the public has to know what we're doing. And I think, to, you should say 60 years ago, as goes General Motors, goes the US economy. I maintain, and we've got every bit of fact to back this up, that as goes travel, goes the US economy. No one, uh, built their business, no one moved to a second home, no one decided where their kids are going to go to school, nothing until they first made a trip. So it's important to bring our industry back and Chip and I and about 50 others have been working on a recovery campaign at the right time called Let's Go There. And when it's right for people to travel, we're going to, as an industry, and this is so important that the whole industry get involved in this any way they can to start saying to America, it's time to start planning. 
plan that next trip. And, and we're going to talk about the excitement and what you've missed. And then at the right time, come back with a across the industry promotional program to get America moving again, because it's so important. And if we don't get that going, we're going to be let, if we let it take its own path, that's a problem. If we can bring this back even six months more quickly, it's seventy billion dollars to our industry. It's another eight hundred thousand jobs. That's why it's so important to bring this thing back because we will bring back the U.S. economy. We're down to just our final few seconds. Chip, tell us what's going to happen in the election this fall. It's an important <laughs> election year for our country. Lots of crazy things happening out there. What are your thoughts? What's going to happen? And you only have a few seconds to uh, sort us out. Well, I think for most of us that work in Washington, D.C., we have learned uh, over the last couple of decades that divided government is actually not such a bad thing uh, because it slows down what would otherwise be bad ideas. So uh, I don't know how good I am at predicting, uh, but I will say there's a lot of focus uh, from a lot of folks that says, let's keep this government uh, divided so that they have to work together on behalf of the American people. Thank you, Chip. Thank you, Roger. And thanks to all of you for joining us for a HoaCon 20. There's going to be much more great content, many more great presentations over the next couple of days. We hope you'll enjoy every one. Thank you very much.